you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. We are in our series um, on the life of Elijah. And today will be um, the last in our series. So 2 Kings chapter 2. And it is found on page 383, what? 383. 383. 383. I'm going to begin with verse 1, chapter 2. Hear then the word of God. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah had said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked, Do you know the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah And Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. And the water divided to the right and to the left. And the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise not. And they were walking along and talking together. And suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. And then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to your word, we give you thanks that you have made yourself known. And so as we read, as we meditate on this, your word, help us to know you. Help us to fall more in love with you. We ask in your name. Amen. What would you do if you knew that you were going to die today? What would you do if you knew you only had 24 more hours to live? Would you get in a car Would you travel to see somebody you know? Would you pick up the phone? Who would you call? Who would you want to go see during that 24 hours that you had left? What if you only had one minute? What if you were on your dead bed and family and friends were standing around you and you only had one minute or less to speak. 
What would you say? What words would you use to communicate to those that you love standing around you? As I've thought about that through the years, and I particularly thought of it back in 2013, as I went in for open heart surgery and my family was around me, and I said to them, to my children and to Hajin, three things. Take care of your mother, love one another, and above all else, love and serve Jesus. Three simple things. Take care of your mother, love one another, love and serve Jesus. What would you say if you knew you only had one minute to live? In earlier generations, Christians talked a lot more about death than we do in our culture. If I were to tell you, listen, I'm throwing a pizza party, Dottie and I are going to buy the pizza, come on over to our house, we're going to talk about death. (laughs) My guess is not too many people would show up, (laughs) except maybe Jade for the pizza. The Puritans, who are part of the founding fathers of our country, even wrote books on death and how as Christians we are to face death and how as Christians it is our duty to die well. So what would you do if today was your last day on earth? That brings us to the story of Elijah's last day on earth in chapter 2. We started our journey with Elijah in the mountains. He was from Gilgal. He went before King Ahab. From King Ahab, he ran and went to the brook and to the ravine, and the Lord fed him there. From there, he went to the cave, and the Lord spoke to him. From there, he went to Mount Carmel, called down fire, confronted the prophets of Baal. From there, he went on to um, a cave in Mount Horeb. He confronted King Ahaziah. And at the end of his ministry, we come here to chapter 2. And he's doing a day's journey. He's walking. You and I would get in a car if it was our day, and we'd go visit the people we wanted to say goodbye to if we had a day left. Elijah didn't have a car, so he's walking. And he goes from Samaria down to Gilgal. From Gilgal, he goes to Bethel. From Bethel, he goes to Jericho. And from Jericho, he goes to the Jordan River. And the young man that he's been discipling, his protege, Elijah, is with him. And it's clear from the text that we read that The Lord had made known that today was the last day to not only Elisha, but also to the prophets in the other towns that Elijah was visiting. And Elijah had time to build relationships, and so now he's sort of on a farewell tour. And Elisha is with him. It's, you almost could make a movie of this final scene You think of somebody like Jimmy Stewart playing the part, maybe, walking along the road with his his son and talking to him. It's a very touching scene, older man, younger man, spending their last few hours together, going from town to town. And one of the beautiful things is that Elijah, the older man, doesn't want to be a burden to Elisha and says, you stay here. You don't have to keep walking with me. I'm okay. But Elisha was so loyal. He said, no, I'm going to go with you. You think of Ruth and Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. Where you're buried, I'm going to be buried. Just the loyalty of Elisha to Elijah is touching in and of itself. 
And then when they come to the river Jordan, Elijah takes his cloak, he strikes the water. It reminds you of the scene of Moses. But before Elijah is taken up, Elijah does something that I think we will likely do if we're, by God's grace, given knowledge that we are about to die. We will say to our children and our grandchildren something to the effect of what Elijah says to Elisha. What can I do for you? What can I tell you? Is there one more thing I can share with you or do for you? And Elisha says, yes, there is. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Elisha at that particular point reveals his true heart. He's revealing the fact that he wants to do the work of Elijah, but he doesn't think he's up for the task. Now, when he asks for a double portion, the meaning of that is in the Old Testament, the oldest son would always receive a double portion of the father's inheritance. And although Elisha was not the physical, biological son of Elijah, he was the spiritual son. And so he's using the language of saying, Father, I want a double portion. I, I want you to bless me. And he's not being presumptuous. This is not some arrogance on the part of, a, of Elisha asking Elijah, give me twice of what you've got. It's not that. It's anxiety. It's worry. Elijah, who he had been following for years, is about to be taken from him. And the mantle is about to be passed to him And Elijah, in all humility, says, I can't do the task. What you've been doing has been wonderful and God has used you. How can God ever use me like he's used you? I'm not up for the task. Yes, if there's one thing you can do for me, give me a double portion so I might do something even in a small way, similar to how God has used you. He wanted the same spirit that Elijah had on top of Mount Carmel. He wanted the same spirit that Elijah had when he stood before King Ahab. He wanted the same spirit that Elijah had when he faced down King Ahaziah. Elisha wanted the spirit of God to be placed upon him so that he too could take up the calling that had been given to Elijah. Elisha realized he could not do the work. He could not be faithful to the calling without God's help. God bless us. If we realize that all the things given to us in Scripture and the calling placed upon our lives to be disciples and to go out into the world cannot be done without God's blessing. Unless God pours his spirit upon us, it can't be done. It simply can't be done. You cannot do it of your own flesh and strength. And Elisha was humble. He says, Elisha, please, I can't do this on my own. I need the same spirit of God that has been within you put upon me. And Elijah says back to him, you've asked a difficult thing. He says it's a difficult thing because it's not his to give. It's a gift of God. It's by God's grace and mercy that his spirit reside upon you. And for us sitting here today, it's no different. It's only by the grace and mercy of God. And so Elijah says, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. And then verse 11 gives us the end of Elijah's time here on earth. It says, and they were walking along and talking together, and suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared. It's a military image. 
These are the armies of God coming to take Elijah home. And it's fitting because Elijah had been doing battle with the principalities and the powers of the unseen world. He had been engaged in fighting evil in the world and standing up for righteousness and justice, compassion and love. He had been obedient to God in the face of evil in the world. He had been doing battle. And so it's not surprising the Lord sends for him the armies of God, figured here in the images of the chariots of fire and the horses of fire to take him home. And Elijah is taken up into heaven in a whirlwind. Sometimes when you see a painting of this scene, you see Elijah in one of the chariots. Whoever painting that painting wasn't reading the text. The text doesn't say that Elijah was taken up in one of the chariots. It says he was taken up in a whirlwind. One commentator says, a glorious storm of the holiness of God. God takes Elijah up in a glorious storm of his holiness. Now, we tend to focus on the departure and how glorious and beautiful a scene that might have been. But verse 12 is the more important verse. Because verse says, 12 tells us, Elisha saw this. Fifty prophets followed from a distance. They watched Elijah and Elisha walking together, and suddenly Elijah disappears. They had no idea what had happened. It was only Elisha whose eyes had been opened to see the flaming horses and flaming chariots. If you see me, Elijah had said. There is a kind of seeing with the eyes, and there is a kind of seeing with the heart. You can live to be 80 years old or 90 years old and have perfect vision and still be totally blind to spiritual realities. That's why Paul prays in Ephesians 1, 18, open the eyes of our heart, O Lord, that I might see. You can come to this church for 90 years. You can be baptized 10 times. You can have 100 Sunday school pins. and still not see. We sing in amazing grace. What do we sing? I once was lost, but now I'm found. So it's blind, but now I see. It's the Lord who has to open your eyes. Hebrews chapter 11 contains a, a phrase that helps us understand this principle. And speaking of Moses, the writer of Hebrews talks about Moses' life being preserved because he saw him who is invisible. Hebrews 11, verse 27, if you want to look it up. He preserved him because he saw him who is invisible. That's one of the most remarkable statements in the Bible. It appears to be an impossibility. Think about it. How do you see an invisible person? If you can be seen, you are not invisible. But God was invisible, and yet the scripture speaks of Moses seeing him. How? Two words. By faith. Moses had faith, and his faith allowed him to see. And he saw the God who was invisible. Faith sees what is really there, even though others see nothing at all. 
By faith we see reality, which means we see beyond the world around us. By faith we see what others do not see. Have you ever looked at one of those 3D images? You sometimes see them on Facebook and people post them, or you sometimes see them in a book. And it's sort of a 3D image. They have all kinds of dots or different kinds of geometric figures. And they tell you, if you look carefully, you'll see the face of Mozart. And you look at it, and you look at it, and some of you see Mozart, and some of you don't see Mozart. I look at it, and I look at it, and all I do is see is geometric figures. To my consternation, Dottie can almost always see the hidden image of Mozart or some other figure, even Jesus. But just because I can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. It's not as if Mozart's head suddenly appears out of no, nowhere. It was there all along. The hidden image is there whether or not I see it. The hidden world of spiritual, eternal realities is there whether or not you see it. It's there. Do you ever get angry at a blind person because they can't see the color green? No, you don't. Because they can't see it. And yet I hear Christians arguing with non-Christians and getting mad at them because they don't believe. How foolish. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4 that Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Non-Christians don't see the spiritual reality that you see because they cannot see the light of the gospel. They don't see what you see even though the reality of what you see is there because their eyes are blind. They don't see it. They will never believe what they don't see and they will never see until their eyes, like your eyes, like my eyes, are opened by the grace of God, by the mercy of God. And only God can do that. So what does that mean? That means... Yeah, we ought to share the gospel. We ought to tell our story about how God has changed our lives. But more importantly, we ought to pray. Because I don't care how many times you share the gospel. Unless you pray and the Lord opens their eyes, you can argue till you're blue in the face. You're never going to convince them. Their eyes have to be open. Elijah said, you can have the power if you see me depart. And how do we know the end? That prayer was answered. Well, you ought to read the rest of the story of Elisha. But in particular, you ought to read the story in chapter 6. Elisha is doing ministry. And King Aram and his armies come and they are about to devour Elisha and his fellow prophets. And when they get up that morning, those traveling with Elisha come to him and they say to him, the armies of King Arab are all around us. We have no chance. We are outnumbered by thousands upon thousands upon thousands. And what does Elisha say? He says, they that are with us are more than they that are with them. And those with Elisha must have been scratching their heads, saying, poor Elijah, he's had too much coffee. He's beginning to see things that really aren't there. And what does Elisha pray? Oh, Lord, 
Open his eyes that he may see. And when the Lord opened the eyes of the disciple of Elisha, what did he see? He looked up into the clouds and he saw in the clouds thousands upon thousands of horses and chariots of the armies of God there to rescue Elijah. Elisha had no fear because he could see behind the veil of what you only can see physically and he saw behind the veil through spiritual eyes and by faith the reality that God is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. And he has his armies in waiting to come to our aid when we need them. And so now one prophet is taken and one prophet is left behind, showing us that the battle goes on. The church triumphant, those who have gone before us are in heaven. The church militant, those of us left here on earth are still doing battle with the principalities and the powers of the unseen world. And so Elijah saw spiritual reality. He saw what was behind the scene and he picks up the cloak. He takes the cloak to the river Jordan and much like Elijah, he places the cloak down in the water and he says, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? It's his way of saying, the mantle's been passed to me, Lord. Lord, now where are you? I need you. Elijah is gone. But Elijah's God, God is still there. And so people ask when great people pass, where has the God of gone? Where's the Lord God? of Elijah? Where's the Lord God of Peter, James, and John? Where's the Lord God of Luther? Where's the Lord God of Calvin? Where's the Lord God of Jonathan Edwards? Where's the Lord God of Hudson Taylor? Where's the Lord God of Jim Elliot? Elijah went to heaven. Elisha's work continued. God's work goes on. It goes on because God goes on. God was here before you and I arrived. And God's work was going on before you and I arrived. And God's work's going to continue when you and I are far gone. Nothing of God's work dies when we die. Life for us will never be the same when one of our loved ones goes. The death of a loved one does change things. But God does not change. God is still with us and he will still use us. Psalm 100 tells us that God's faithfulness continues throughout all the generations. Exodus 20 tells us that God shows his love to a thousand generations. Psalm 100 verse 5 tells us that what God is to the grandfather, he will be to the father. And what he is to the father, he will be to the son. And what he is to the son, he will be to the grandson. And what he is to the grandson, he will be to the great-grandson. God's faithfulness will continue to every generation. I'm 68 years old. Many of you are much older than me. Do we have another year, two years? Do we have another five years? 20? Praise God. <laughs> and as you think about your life, you think about, I certainly think about, how much of my life is wrapped up in my children. For those of you who are grandparents, how much of your life is wrapped up in your grandchildren? For Dottie and I, how much of our lives in these perhaps latter years of our lives 
is wrapped up in international students. And you worry about where your children are, and how they're doing. You worry about your grandchildren and where they're going to be, what's going to happen to them. Dod Dottie and I think about Hajin and others. How are they doing? What's going to happen to them? And we worry and we pray. But what ought to give us confidence is if in this life, even if God does not answer all of our prayers, they're going to be okay. You don't have to stay alive to have God continue to work. I can trust God to take care of my children, my grandchildren, the students. That's who ultimately takes care of them. God's faithfulness continues for children, for grandchildren, great-grandchildren, even though we are gone. The Lord God of Elijah is also the Lord God of Elijah. And the Lord God of Elijah is your God. He's your God. And you have the same responsibility that Elijah had of picking up the mantle. It would be interesting for you to think about when you became a Christian, who was the person who put the mantle of Elijah on your shoulders and called you to be a follower of Jesus? That call is still upon you. And the God of Elijah, the God of Luther, the God of Jim Elliot is your God. He goes before you. Are you called to be out in the world doing battle with the principalities and powers of the unseen world? Yep. Are you to be out into the world infiltrating the territories of Satan, erecting signposts that he is king? Yep. Do you need to fear? Nope. Because if you look with your eyes, not your physical eyes, but the eyes of faith. You will see the clouds rolled back, and you will see thousands upon thousands of chariots and horses, the armies of God, ready and willing to come to your rescue. They are there. And the spirit of Elijah, the spirit of Elisha, is now upon you. And so we pray. Open our eyes, Lord, that the hope that is ours in Christ may be our true hope. Help us open our eyes that we might recognize false hopes in this world. Open our eyes so we can know the riches that are ours in Christ and open our eyes so that we can dismiss the fake rewards that the world has to offer us. And open our eyes so that we can know the greatness of the power of God and open our eyes so that we can reject the powers of this world and open our eyes so that we can Jesus see Jesus as he truly is far above all rule and authority far above all power and dominion and open our eyes so we can readily and willingly submit to his power his dominion his glory May the spirit of Elijah, may the spirit of Elijah, may the spirit of our God be upon you and keep you now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we live in this world that is so confusing because it offers us so many false hopes of what to place our hope in. And it offers us, offers us so many fake rewards to please us and to satisfy us. And so we ask, this morning even, that you would open the eyes of our hearts so that we could understand what our true hope is, that we can understand what our true inheritance is, that we can understand what 
Your power is in us, working by your grace and mercy. And when we go out into this world and we're fearful, we're nervous, we feel despair, open the eyes so that, like Elijah, we can see the clouds rolled back and we can see the armies of God ready to come to our aid. Help us to place our faith in you, the God who is our refuge and our strength. In his name we pray. Amen. Why don't we stand, why don't we sing together? These are the days of Elijah.